Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Real Review Live. Uh, my name is Hugh and Hook, and I'm joined tonight by Amanda Yellop, who is also working with us now on The Real Review. Amanda is a well-known sommelier from uh, the Fink Group, the key restaurant in particular in Sydney, and uh, it's part of our tasting team now. We're going to be talking about champagne, which is what everybody is thinking about at this time of the year, of course. And yes, it's not quite the end of the year yet, but we can't wait to get there, can we? Because it's been such a testing and difficult year full of all sorts of challenges. And there'll be, I think there'll be more champagne drunk at the end of this year than there has been ever. That's my prediction. Because there are so many reasons why we want to toast the end of 2020 and, and, and welcome 2021. Absolutely. In, in the hope that it's going to be a better year. Um, just a couple of things we're going to be tasting with Plum tonight, Plum three, Plum version 3 white wine glass, which is also a very good sparkling and champagne glass. We're using this one probably because it's got a bit bigger bowl and I like the big bowl for champagne. Um, often flutes are a little too narrow to get a great bouquet out of champagne, I think. Uh, the, the delivery on the palate as well, I think. You know, flutes are great for saving the bubbles, but if you actually want to see the wine, smell the wine, taste the wine, I think the bigger cup it makes a lot more sense. And I'm sure we'll talk about glassware as we go along more and more. But champagne, let's let's have a little talk about champagne. It's because I've had a terrible year there, and I think for the middle six months of this year, the champagne sales were down globally by one third, which is a huge drop. And that was estimated to cost them $2 billion, $2 billion with a B, that is. But fortunately, the end of the year has come along. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of countries and, and places are now out of lockdown and drinking more champagne, I would imagine. And also, champagne has had a very good harvest this year. So the harvest is normally August, September in champagne. And so they've had a very good one. They've had three good vintages on the trot. They've all been warm, dry seasons, and they seem to be having more of those in Champagne now. Um, but probably partly in response to the pandemic and the decrease in sales demand, the authorities decided to decrease the possible yield of grapes this year. So normally they'd be doing more than 10 tonnes per hectare they're allowed to harvest, and all this is controlled by the organisation. This year, only eight tonnes per hectare. So uh, there'll be, it'll be a high quality but low quantity a year. Mm. One of those, uh, almost a cliche, isn't it? It is considerable though. It's a considerable drop, yeah. it is. And you can imagine a lot of these wines are between three and six years in the cellars. They've got to look that far ahead when they're making decisions about how many bottles to put in the cellar and how many, how many kilos or tonnes to harvest. It's a difficult thing to do. Well, they certainly don't want to sit on too much fruit, too much wine, just because it does cost a lot more money for them. But also, as you said, they've had three fantastic vintages, so there's a lot less disease pressure, so the quality of the fruit is also quite high. Exactly. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was talking with, uh, well, I was listening to Gilles de la Rousière from Onrio recently. Uh, I was listening to him on Zoom cast, and he said, we have, to, we have survived the terrible times of two world wars and the Great Depression of the 1930s. Champagne is not always a successful business to be in. Mm -hmm. And in, the subject is that we will overcome this just as we've overcome all the other setbacks. And I've no doubt that they will. So champagne, the great drink of celebration. And we're here to guide you through eight bottles of what we think are pretty good champagnes. Absolutely. And we have, uh, I'll let you do in secret, we've had a little pre-taste of them, so we know what's coming up. Um, quite a range of styles. Champagne, of course, can be non-vintage or vintage. It can be rosé, it can be blanc de blanc, blanc de noir, and right at the top, prestige, prestige cuvee yeah. or deluxe cuvee, whatever you like to call them. And we have one of those to finish up with. But we're going to start at the bottom. Not really. There is no bottom. Entry level, <laughs> entry level, entry level here. Entry level is a far more acceptable terminology. Absolutely. Um, and the entry level wine we're starting with is Paul Roger, which is um, not just any wine either. It's one of my favourite houses, I've got to say. Um, it's um, a bit of a favourite of yours too, Amanda. Absolutely. It's, I mean, the consistency and the quality of this house, it just gets better and better. It has been around for a dreadfully long time. But I think that you see that in the quality of the fruit. This is their entry level wine and it's made the top eight. That's pretty exciting. That's a pretty, a pretty good effort. A pretty good effort indeed. Um, Paul Roger, I think um, 
Oh, I do have to say that we have seller door to door happening here, which means that um, you can order some of these wines if you click on the icon on our website. And I will hasten to add that we don't sell wine, we don't take a cut, we don't make money from it, we just give it, we just try to make it easy for people to buy the wine if they want to. And we do hope that some of you have got at least one bottle of champagne in front of you so that you can sip along with us, even if you may not have one of the wines that we're tasting. We're going to taste two wines and then we'll take some questions and then we'll taste the next two wines, take more questions and we'll go through the eight of them in that order. We'll have to fight over who answers what questions. This is a... Uh, I'm up uh, for it. I'm absolutely <laughs> up for it. I think it's great that we're actually starting on our end of year as well. It's the Paul Roger Fruit Reserve. Non-vintage is a blend of varieties. It could be a blend of villages. It could be, it's definitely a, a blend of years. But I think that's the flagship of what we're looking at. So it's, it's a, as a kickoff, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, the non-vintage is what uh, every house, basically, that's the flag that they fly. The wine that they sell the most of by far, it's the bread and butter wine of just about, is it, of every champagne house, except maybe a handful of little people that only do vintage. Um, it's um, of necessity, a blend because that's the way they get consistency from year to year, from blend to blend, and try and out, iron out the vicissitudes of yep. harvest differences, weather differences. Um, most non vintages would be based on the vintage immediately preceding the bottling, um, but there would be various vintages preceding that blended in with that vintage to give you um, a consistent product. And a bit more weight and a bit more structure. And because it is a marginal area in Champagne, we're talking about really sort of northern viticulture. So they do have great discrepancies from year to year. So that's why non-vintage really helps them out. So they can use those wines from a previous year, reserve wines, add it in and make sure that they've got a high quality wine year in, year out. Yeah, and I guess there was a time when you really couldn't make still wine in Champagne. It was too cold. Mm -hmm. These days, I suspect that some people would have a better chance at making a still wine if they wanted to because the seasons are getting warmer, the sun is shining more often, not having as many terrible wet, diseasey years that they used like they used to have. Um, but Paul Roger is a very admired Champagne house. I don't, I've never heard a bad word spoken about Paul Roger. It's um, uh, it's a family-owned business by the Debilly and Paul Roger families. Uh, they still run the place. It's based in Epinay, the second most important city in Champagne after Reims. And they have about 51% of their grape requirements supplied by their own vineyards, which is quite high. Mm -hmm. Not as high as um, one person we'll come to we'll come later. To later yeah. um, but it's pretty good. Um, I don't think there's a winery in Champagne that's as clean or any cleaner or more scrupulously looked after than Paul Roger. It is gleamingly clean and white and, and the stainless steel everywhere. They don't use barrels. They don't use they don't ferment in concrete tanks. Um, it's all terribly pristine. Everything's done at cold temperature. Take away that risk. It's very Australian sort of characteristic, I think, when I think of cellar doors. Stainless steel. Stainless and, steel and cleanliness. Yeah, cleanliness. Because that's the style there. Anyway, very different to something like Bollinger or Krug. This is the style thing. And how they achieve their style is this way. Cold, cold settling, cold fermentation, and then very cold aging. Their cellars are the deepest and the coldest in Champagne. Or sorry, they like to tell us, which they go down to about nine degrees or something. Very cold. And when it's that cold, it actually just slows everything down. And the idea is they're capturing every single nuance, every single intimate moment of that production to get the very best out of their fruit. And obviously, champagne has a touch of artifact. They're looking at at least a period of time on leaves and a little bit of time in cellar. So they're not just looking at fruit. They're looking at extra complexity. So when it's done at such a cold temperature, it does take longer and you get that freshness. We're Australian. We demand freshness in our wines. And when you have a, a wine that has a heavy um, Pinot Noir sort of dominance, then mm, you think, mm. oh, well, I might not be getting that freshness. And I think this really does yeah, deliver. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's taste the let's wine. Taste. It's made from the three classic grapes in roughly equal proportions. So Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir Meunier and Chardonnay. And there is 25% reserve wine, which means the wine from previous harvests blended with the latest harvest uh, before it's bottled. And then the amount of time it spends on its leaves in the bottle has been lengthened in recent times to about between three and a half and four and a half years. So that's quite a long time for a non-vintage to be on its leaves. And 
that gives it that lovely bready cracked yeast character, which I just love in champagne. Yeah, it's you get it in the aroma, you get it on the on the taste on the palate, but you also get that lovely sort of creaminess on the texture. And for me, when you're looking at wine, you're looking at taste and you're looking at texture. And I think this, I mean, it's just vibrant. It is pretty. It's those lovely sort of expectations, sort of citrus notes that you would expect from Chardonnay. You get those lovely sort of um, pastry notes, bread dough that you would expect from thyme on leaves. It, sometimes you also get it from a little bit of um, oak contact. I think this is definitely the leaves contact that I'm getting that from. Mm -hmm. You also get that little bit of earthiness. Um, for me, it has that little bit of that white mushroom. Yes. And, it, yeah. it, and it's, you know, that young, fresh, mm. forest floor sort of mm. white mushroom. Mm. It adds to complexity. It adds to the structure of the wine. And it's dry as a bone. There's no sweetness here. No, it's a beautifully balanced wine. That's one of the things that I admire about Pole is the harmony. They, they seem to get this effortless balance. It just seems to all, all the pieces are falling into place perfectly. And uh, I think it's released that way. Yeah. You know, some of the, yeah. you know, when you have an NV, the expectation is it's, to be drunk on release. And this wine looks very, very good. And often we drink an NV immediately. You can drink it when it's a little bit older, but it's actually made to be drunk young. Yes. Intended to be drunk young. And as you say, this wine is really in the zone now. It's a beautiful wine. So um, let me see what we scored it. We scored it 92, which is a pretty good score for a non-vintage. Um, Excellent. It was, it was rated 54 out of 139 Pinot Noir based uh, champagnes. Um, that's a pretty pretty good ranking as well, considering there are a lot of vintage wines in there too. Um, we don't give you a cellaring recommendation for these wine, for non-vintage wines as we do for other wines, because frankly, we don't know when you bought it and how old it was when you bought it. But rule of thumb for all non-vintage wines, I think, and I'll get Amanda's opinion on this, is don't, don't sell them unless it's a, a Bollinger or a Louis Roder or a Krug or something that you know will, will, will age, even the non-vintages will age beautifully. But drink them within two or three years of buying them and try and buy the freshest. Absolutely. And if you come across one, you go to a parent's house and you've actually found a bottle, you don't know how old it is. When you pull the cork out, you can normally see when the cork is quite skinny, it's quite old. That yeah, doesn't mean the wine is not drinkable. Definitely taste it. But it's going to show the evolution of age, that slow decay in bottle. And it does happen over a long period of time. And if you had it next to a bottle that you purchased the week before, you might be able to spot the difference. Some people can, some people can't. But obviously, it depends on the storage. Pretty so, important. And what would you drink with this? Would you well, like to talk about what Absolutely. We've contacted the, um, all of the Maisons to see what they recommend. So we'll come with their recommendation, but we'll probably add in a few of our own. And obviously, this is somebody from Australia because they've actually added um, natural oysters direct from Coffin Bay, South Australia, or kingfish sashimi with a touch of citrus and a Asian esque flavour. I do think that champagne classically you would serve with oysters. You cannot go to a champagne bar or a restaurant or wine bar in Champagne without being offered oysters or scallops, any sort of shellfish. I think that there's a little bit of flexibility there. I'm looking at simplicity. I look like Asian flavors. I'd be thinking lemongrass, I think maybe a touch of ginger, maybe a touch of radish. You could have it with a salad. You can have it with light seafood. You could even have it with a main course. This is very much, even though it's Pinot dominant and aperitif style for me because of the freshness on the palate, I would have it without food and with food. Here, here. That's the, the nature of a really good non-vintage, I think. And Miranda, while I'm pouring the next wine, yep. permit me to tell a little story about Christian Paul Roger, who was one of the great people of Champagne who's retired now. Did you meet him? No, I haven't met him. He, um, he's quite senior now, but um, in his earlier days, I went to his house for a dinner once when I was when I won the Van der Champagne Award and he invited his guests into the dining room and he reaches down onto the floor and picks up what looked like a fresh doggy doggy do off the beautiful eggshell blue carpet, picks it up in his hand, puts it in his trouser coat pocket and sits down. But that was one of many practical jokes. It wasn't real, <laughs> it was plastic. That was one of many practical jokes that he performed during that lunch. And he I had, was a bit frightened where had, you were going to go there. I was like, oh, yeah, people in stitches. Dear. One of the great funny people of Champagne and a really nice man presided over a great house. Excellent. Anyway, up to the sorry, second wine. I should put number two wine here, Absolutely. shouldn't I? Which so this is goes the, in the center. Ayala, Brut Majeure, non-vintage. Yes, and this is uh, their, as we said before, the entry-level wine. 
And it's owned by the same house. I think you can do the background. Yes, yes. It's owned by the same house as Bollinger, uh, the same company as Bollinger, same family as Bollinger. And it's in the same village as Bollinger, which is AE. Um, two letters, AE, A-Y, with a dot over and two dots over the Y. Okay. And uh, hence the name Ayala, I guess. But they they were not associated until relatively recently, but now they're only about the eight same, years ago from it? memory, give or take mm. a year or two. I remember mm. there was quite a bit of excitement, particularly in Australia, that they're coming together. And as you're aware, they're stylistically completely different. Very. Bollinger is dominant with Pinot Noir, has time in oak. Uh, Bollinger has their own uh, cooperage. Ayala has no oak, it's dominant in Chardonnay. Um, we did taste this wine a little bit earlier in the day, and this is not the best bottle that we've had. No, so we're going to be describing the wine as it was when we tasted the best we've had. The best we've had. Because it's not in great form today and um, um, possibly the cork is not a perfect cork. But it is a good champagne. It's not the most expensive champagne here. I think it's the cheapest champagne we've got here. In so uh, we, um, we have to make allowances for that, but the cork, I think, has let it down slightly. But it is an old house. It was established in 1860. And um, as, as Amanda said, the proportion of Chardonnay is quite high. I think it's um, more than 40% these days in the Brut Majeur and quite a contrast in style, as she was saying. They've also decreased the amount of dosage, which is the sweetness that is added after disgorgement. It used to be 11 grams per litre and now it's seven. So that's a big drop, isn't it? It is. And 11 is still on the higher side. A lot of the producers are now coming to eight or nine and some are creeping down to seven. There is a, a consumer drive for drier wines. And around the world, everybody wants to have a dry wine. Nobody's really looking for a sweet champagne. And if you had a champagne with 11 grams of dosage, I, don't, I wouldn't classify it necessarily as sweet, but it's a little bit softer and tends to be more approachable. Hmm. And I think that hmm. you've got to have very high quality fruit when you're looking at seven grams of dosage. You do, because there's no sweetness masking effect. Um, the old story is, you know, if you've got a really bad quality wine, just sweeten it up a bit and no one will notice. The obverse is true as well. It has to be very good to stand sort of naked without the protection of, of sweetness. Um, and as we were saying, this wine is quite crisp and dry and it's an aperitif style. It's light, it's not particularly complex, uh, but it's a very good aperitif wine when it's on form. This one is a little bit below par but uh, we're not going to dwell on that anymore. I think we can see that in the tasting notes. Uh, when mm. you tried this last year and you said you saw meringue, icing sugar, it was really fresh, clean and lively. Yes, yes. And we're really getting quite a bit of almost that butter, a bruised apple sort of note, which is a bit of a surprise. I mean, it's still drinkable, mm. but I do think it's definitely the cork. I think most people would enjoy that wine. And, well, and it would need food, are, I think. We are a little fussy. Um, <laughs> it's the nature of our... Of our profession, I suppose. I, I could still drink that wine at a party. Um, well, so if you put a glass, it's very yeah, polite. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've scored at 89, and it's we've said that was the uh, the previous time we tasted it. And again, it's a non-vintage, so we're not going to give you a cellaring guideline. Um, but we would like to tell you what food we think goes with so it. So again, we've uh, contacted the Maison. And they came back with, uh, they consider it to be the perfect aperitif, which is, I think, classic when you have a Chardonnay dominant um, champagne and to serve something like fresh seafood, such as oysters or perhaps prawns. And I think that's a very good idea. I do think you could have scampi, you could have scallops, you could have any sort of lighter um, white fish or white meat. I do think it really is dependent on how you're serving. If you had it as a carpaccio, if you had kingfish, you could get away with it, some sort of ceviche. You could also get away with, you know, being very, very um, light handed on dressing, a little, perhaps a touch of olive oil, not heavy in butter, particularly with this particular mm, butter itself, mm, mm. where normally I think butter and champagne is the bee's knees. We'll come to some of those later, I think, won't yeah. we? But no, maybe not this one. This is a more delicate style. Okay. It still has acidity. It still has plenty of acidity and it's a good wine. Well, next wine we're looking at is the... Uh, uh, the Devoe, the Cuvée. No, we're not. We're oh, looking no, no. at some questions first. Oh, sorry, sorry I'm about jumping that. ahead there. What's uh, the first question? Joy Smith says, do all champagne houses produce a non-vintage champagne? Well, I think pretty much they do. And if they're not happy with the non-vintage, they would sell it to somebody else to sell. Whether they sell it as fruit or they might sell it as 
ready-made wine. If they don't want to put their label on it because they're unhappy or they're a bit embarrassed, they don't think it's up to par, they'll sell it to a co-op or to somebody else or sell it to a supermarket. Yes, I think there are some very small producers who specialise in vintage wines and in special parcels salon. of wine and mm. salon would be one, although it is owned by a larger company, isn't it? It is. And I mean, it, there is, there's another producer that we're not looking at today that's often referred to as declassified salon because salon only produces yes. vintage yes. Chardonnay. Yep. But certainly non-vintage is the bread and butter of champagne and pretty much everybody does them. Uh, the second question will, uh, it's John, and we'll, he says, sounds like the first two champagnes, first fermentation is a stainless steel. What's the difference in oak, difference to oak aging? Is it the wood taste? Um, it's not the taste of wood, is it, Amanda? It's, it's the, the effect. It's the effect. It's the ingress of oxygen. It depends on the size of the wood. It depends on the length of exposure to the wood. It depends on how... Uh, toasty the wood is because you can have different degrees of toastiness it depends on what essentially the winemaker will decide what they're looking for as the end result and that's what they'll put in but when you're looking at something like Ayala with no sign of oak I would think in a blind taste you might struggle a bit because it did look a little bit aged and it had that butteriness mm, so it's a little bit mm, harder to tell mm. um, but we know for a fact that there's no oak there. No I think that champagnes that uh, oak has become newly refashionable in champagne of course before stainless steel was invented and before all of the other uh, fancy uh, you know enamel lined concrete and so on was invented everything was in wood of some sort uh, but they went away from that when they got all excited about stainless steel. Now there's a ten tendency to, to put at least the top wines in a, a at least give them some wood aging just to enhance the complexity of them uh, in a lot of houses now. So their regular wines might not have any oak, but their, their top wines might. But they the cherry whole, pick them. The whole point is not to have wood flavour though, it's to have the maturation effect. So they're older barrels usually, aren't they? They are, but also there's a greater sense of control today than what they had 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So. Stainless steel brings, brings that sense of control, it makes it fresher, makes it easier, makes it safer, you're less worried about microbial activity. But now that we um, control what's happening with the oak and we make sure that it's nice and clean, whatever your intention is, you can actually use that, whether it's a long time or a short time. Yes, yes. And it, again, it is the maturation process. And if you're using barrels, they, you know, if you don't look after them carefully, they can have all sorts of microbial issues in them. They have to be looked after very carefully. Not everybody's very good at doing that. So moving on to number three, which is the Devo. Uh, Devo is an interesting wine. Um, it's the Cuvée D, which is a prestige. It's had at least five years. Asia. Yes, that's right. As the little tag here says. It's a little tag on the neck there that says five years of aging in the cellar. So I think that's their minimum. They do, obviously they start disgorging, you know, say on January the 1st, if they were, and they were, probably disgorge it all through the year. And so the last one they disgorge is a year older. So Absolutely. it could be say six years on lease for the last disgorged. But Champagne de Vaux is an interesting company because it's a cooperative um, it, or it's produced by a cooperative and it's in the south of Champagne, which is the Cote de Bar. Have you been to the Cote de Bar? I've driven through it and I've had lunch. You've had lunch. <laughs> it's a good place for lunch. Uh, also known as the Aube, and this is a, a separate part of Champagne. It's sort of not joined on to the Côte de Blanc, Montagne de Rams and the Valle de la Marne. It's separate to them, and it's closer actually to Chablis than it is to Rams, I believe. Um, so it's a little warmer, and it's noted for producing Pinot Noir, and a lot of the houses up north use a bit of Aube material, especially mm -hmm. A richer Pinot Noir to bolster some of their own wines. Or it's to... easier to ripen the Pinot Noir that little bit further south as well. Mm -hmm. So you're less worried about green tannin. It's a bit safer. And also, obviously, when you're looking at small producers, they couldn't afford to purchase land in a greater Champagne region. So mm -hmm. that was the first place they went to that they found similar sort of chalk profiles. Yes, the chalk being the important thing in any Champagne vineyard. Absolutely. Um, but uh, this company is based there. Just about all of their wines are uh, Aube wines, although they do own a bit of Cote de Blanc as well, I believe. Uh, but there are 800 growers and 1,400 hectares of vines uh, wow. associated with this cooperative, uh, which is called, um, um, yeah, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's a big cooperative. But 
it's a small percentage, maybe 5% of the very best fruit the winemaker can siphon off to make their own wines uh, under the DeVoe Champagne DeVoe label. And the D de DeVoe is the top wines. This one's got a big D on the label. There are about four wines, I think, in the D range, and that's their prestige range. So they're more complex, more expensive, obviously, but also more powerful wines. Uh, they use a bit of barrel mm -hmm. to, to produce them. This one's 55% Pinot Noir, 45% Chardonnay, no Pinot Meunier. Hmm. I love this wine. I think it's outstanding. It has great presence on the palate. It's, it's more of an opulent example. Being Pinot Noir dominant, you would expect that. For me, you get this lovely sort of richness on the palate. You get um, stone fruit. You get marzipan. You get that little bit of grip on the, on the back palate, which I think is a combination of not so much skin tannin, but really oak tannin. And it's just present, it's intriguing. It adds that little bit more, makes you salivate a little bit more. Lovely sort of spine of acidity, but it's so fresh. This has had five years on lees. And as you said before, it's quite expensive because that means for five years it's sitting in a cellar and then it has to be released. They're not making any money. And they picked that fruit so many years ago. Yes. So it has to be quality in order for them to recoup the cost. Exactly. It absolutely does. But I think that this is an outstanding example and it's showing particularly well. Yeah. And, and do you think that the body of the wine reflects where it's grown? Like, is it got more full body perhaps than a Montagne in Iran wine? For me, that's the, it's the ripeness of the vintage. It depends on the, because it is such a marginal climate. If you get a great deal of sunlight, you protect the grapes, but you actually have cool nights. You also protect the acidity. You might have that longer growing season and the phenolic compounds inside the skins can actually ripen to a, to a, a harmonious sort of level. I think it adds, adds complexity, but the fact is Pinot Noir is always going to have a bit more body, but yeah. this has had a little bit of time in oak. It's had five years on these. All of these things collectively add up to a rock star wine. Yeah, I'm pretty impressed with that wine. I think it's terrific. And if people, I'm not suggesting they do, but I suspect there is a tendency in some quarters for people to look down their nose a little bit at the southernmost part of Champagne. Absolutely. Um, taste this wine and you'll change your mind completely. Absolutely. And a lot of the small growers now, because Champagne historically has been um, just a plethora of, of grand marks, the small growers are getting louder. Um, People are retiring, their kids are taking over the vineyards, they're no longer handing over the contracts for the Grand Marks to purchase the fruit, they want to make their own wine. But if you're an assistant winemaker and you want to have something of your own, you can only afford to go further south. So there's a lot of exciting conversations happening down there. People are experimenting a little bit more. Mm. In France, people don't like to experiment that much, but the grower champagne community really do. Mm. Mm. And I think that why this is not the perfect example for that, when you combine the Orb region, you think the grower champagne, you think the history and you think the legacy, you can come out with some fantastic wines at sometimes very reasonable prices mm, and sometimes mm. they're not so fantastic. They should be afford more affordable and I some, do of think them, so. some of them are. And some of them are producing these single vineyard Chardonnays from the Mongeur vineyard, I think, yeah. which oh. is apparently um, a particularly chalky bit of ground which produces great Chardonnay. So look out for those. I haven't seen any in Australia. But uh, you can find them in Australia. Jacques Lassan. Yeah. Check this out. Yeah. Okay, so we scored this wine 95, which is a gold ribbon score, and that's a really good score. Um, it's a non vintage, so we're not going to tell you how long to keep it. But um, if I bought that bottle today, I wouldn't be in any, if I had half a dozen of them, I'd be drinking them over the next several years. I wouldn't have. I don't I think there's think so. any hurry to drink it. No, I think that particularly if you had six bottles, you can drink one today, one in six months or nine months, and do mm. it that way. So you can watch the evolution. The yes. wine is definitely going yes. to evolve. Um, yes. And again, we went to the uh, Maison for the food and wine match. They came back with a lobster bisque with crab ravioli and crispy bread. Duck foie gras with... Uh, a second choice. Yeah. With a uh, smoked duck breast and raspberry vinegar. I'm not oh. keen on the vinegar portion myself, but I do think that food and wine matching, it has a lot of freedom. I love bread mm -hmm. and butter and champagne. Mm -hmm. yep. I love bread and butter and Chardonnay. I love bread and butter and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and champagne. I think that you just Pinot. have that lovely sort of richness. But if you think mm -hmm. about crab itself or lobster itself, and even marin, they tend to be slightly sweeter shellfish meats yep. and they have a bit more butter. This can take a bit of richness in the dish. You can swap the protein out. You're just looking for that butter and that richness. 
And this is a top rank wine because it scored number 20 out of 139 Pinot Noir blends from Champagne. So that's a really good achievement. That's an excellent achievement. I think achievement. that's a lovely wine. I'm going to look forward to having, I hate to tip it out. I know, it um, feels wrong. Uh, it feels very wrong. And I'm going to look forward to having some more of that wine later on. So I think the next one is the uh, Onrio. It's a Blanc de Blanc non-vintage. So we've gone from something very Pinot-y to something that's 100% Chardonnay. Um, very big contrast. Absolutely. So Con Onrio, let me tell you a little bit about Onrio. Onrio is um, a very highly regarded house established in 1808. So they've only recently had their, well, a few, few years ago, they had their, their big 200th birthday. It's under the eighth generation um, member of the family guiding it now, Gilles de la Rousière, who I quoted at the beginning of the program. Um, but uh, they are a very distinguished family. Uh, Joseph Henriot was the big mover and shaker. He'd passed away rather rather young a few years ago. But he bought Cape Mentel and Cloudy Bay in Australia and New Zealand for the LVMH group when he worked for them. But he is a member of that family. He went back and then after working for LVMH, went back to his own family company and built that place. They built the empire. They not only have Henriot Champagne, they have Bouchard Perret Fils in Burgundy, William Fever in Chablis, and they have a Beaujolais property and an Oregon property in the USA. Um, they are, uh, I think, high quality people who are very fastidious. They own something like two thirds of the grapes. Um, it's pretty high. And they are very high on Grand and Premier Cru rated vineyards. Um, else can I tell you? It's, uh, I've had the pleasure of visiting uh, this producer uh, uh, yes. on one of my trips to Champagne. They have this lovely sort of um, chateau outside Epinay. And that's when I was uh, telling somebody earlier today that we had a uh, champagne in the garden with radishes that were pulled straight out of the dirt and just washed under a hose. People don't like, it's considered to be controversial radishes and champagne, but I think Number one, if somebody grows radishes and pulls them out of the garden for you, you should definitely enjoy them. But having it with a glass of champagne in the sunlight, it's a gorgeous way to spend the morning. That's a funny idea having, I reckon it's a funny idea having radishes with champagne, but I'm sure it was wonderful Absolutely. at the time. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I love radishes with gin myself, but it was pretty good. No, and we also we had it later in the day. Champagne. Yeah, we had it later in the day with um, radishes and just a, a green leaf salad yeah. with, with a Blanc de Blanc. Mm. I think that it just goes that flexibility. Well, this is the this Blanc de Blanc. We need to taste the wine, and it's. I think what you can see in this wine, firstly to me, is that it's got maturity. It's a non-vintage it wine, but it's got a lot of age material in it. And I was talking before about reserve wines. This has got forty percent reserve wines in it, and they don't get much higher than that really in Champagne. I think that's extraordinary. Even Charles Heidsick is yeah. about forty. I think. Thirty-eight now, thirty-eight percent. Is that right? So forty percent is extraordinary, and you can actually see that on the palate. There's richness, there's opulence. For me, it has this lovely sort of stone fruit, white peach, white nectarine, lovely sort of citrus notes, almost that sort of um, orange oil and fresh lime. Wow. I'm also getting, it's a little bit weird, but I'm getting that um, curry leaf, which is a, mm -hmm. that spice. Okay. Um, but for me, it's just the texture. It's so creamy. It is a sublime wine. It is. And I get a lot of toastiness and a lot of Lee's aged um, yeah. cracked yeast character coming through there. But the uh, the volume of flavour in that wine is is stunning. And the electric acidity just lifts it off the palate. It really does drive it and it just feels so fresh and so tight. Yet you can clearly see on the palate the age. One of the things in this wine, I, I talked about 40% reserve wine, which could be the previous year, the year before that, and the year before that, mm -hmm. maybe the last five or six years. But they also put a tiny amount of their special perpetual cuvee in it, which is a Solero, which goes way back. Jacques Salos does something similar to some of his wines. It goes back many years, and they don't really know how old it is. But a little bit of this essence goes into the wine and gives it extra character. So a special wine, I think, and, and just a humble non-vintage, but it's a, a great Blanc de Blanc from a very, very esteemed house. I think it's a little bit more than humble. It's a non-vintage, but it is extraordinary. We scored at 96, which is a very high gold ribbon. And um, Amanda's going to tell us about the food. 
I'll give you the uh, houses food match to start yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, best served in a tulip shaped glass that will allow the aromas and the flavors to be fully expressed. We we're talking about that before. When you have a flute, it saves the bubbles, but when you have a larger glass, it really does showcase the aromas and the taste and actually you get a bit more of that texture on the palate. Um, it's delightful as an aperitif, served simply with oysters or grilled fish, but also works with stronger flavors with that are intense and powerful in champagne. Something like a truffle stuffed chicken breast with supreme sauce or simple truffle cabernet or brie. I do think Camembert. that- Camembert. Oh, Camembert. what did I say? Camembert. Cabernet. Yeah. Sorry. Matter, well, matter. that would be a little bit of a um, left field match. It would, it would. <laughs> it would. Um, I do think that it just shows you the flexibility. I would love this with just um, some seared scallops, some butter, a little bit mm. of salt, maybe yeah. a little bit of fennel. I think you could do anything, any seafood with butter, and particularly when you're having blanc de blanc. This is an NV, so it's there's. It's not quite ferocious acidity, but it's so fine. It has no austerity with it though. It just has that lovely generous sort of texture. So when you're having that with food, you have the high acidity, you can have a richer dish because the acidity itself cleans up the palate. It does almost refresh the palate each time you have a bite. And then I would love this with something a little bit green, maybe a little bit of sorrel or leek. Think, yeah, I don't think, I think that's the, 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 the decorations on the edges that, the more important thing is the butteriness to me. Absolutely. I reckon whether it's an aged still Chardonnay or a white Burgundy or a Chardonnay from Champagne with age on it, that butteriness comes through and goes beautifully with any dish with butter. So you Especially could have this seafood. with bread and butter, or mm -hmm. I think you could, you could easily have this solo with no food. Bread and butter. Yeah. I often say I could be happy with just really good bread and really good butter and a really good wine. <laughs> and the rest of the meal can... Go jump. No, I'm not quite. <laughs> so a couple of questions, Amanda. Um, um, Edward says, I've tasted some great Blanc de Blanc, mm -hmm. Blanc de Noir, sorry, from Mernia recently and was very pleasantly surprised with the quality. Extra Brut from the Valley de La Champagne, don't know them. Do you know them? I Can I ask your view on these mono crew grower champagnes? Off I think that they have the potential to be super exciting. I love the premise. They're looking at minimal intervention. They're looking at highlighting one little small plot. They're highlighting a grape Meunier, which often people snub just because it's considered to be the poor cousin of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but does offer an approachability. When you're looking at these growers, the one thing that they sort of struggle with is they don't really have the reserve wines that the Grand Marks have. Like we said, the Onrio had 40% reserve wines, which is insane. And when you have a grower champagne, they didn't have that freshness, but they, Sometimes they're missing that extra complexity from the reserve wines. Reserve wines give that. That doesn't mean it's a poor wine. It just means it's a different wine. I love the idea of supporting the small grower. I think that's pretty cool, but it's not a guarantee of quality. Mm -hmm. It's not until you pour it in the glass, you go, I really enjoy that. I love that. And the reason I love it is yes. because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But always visit, always look for something new. Always play with that. Yes. Um, Jean-Noël says, Michel Parisot, who was the chief winemaker from Devoe, who's been there for at least 20 years, I think, he's rusted on. He's doing a great job. Has just been nominated IWC, that's International Wine Challenge, Sparkling Winemaker of the Year. I didn't know that, John Noel. Thank you for that information. Can't imagine anybody who would deserve it more, frankly. He's put Excellent. on, he's put in. Um, is that two questions? It is. We'll come back to Nat later because that's an interesting question. I can't, like I can't quite pour? read it from where I am. Well, this is the, um... well, while you're pouring, she says... Um, what is skin tannin versus oak tannin and also green tannin, which you mentioned, I think. Can you be a bit more uh, detail on that? Absolutely. I don't want to get too nerdy and boring, but when you're talking about oak tannin, it's the grip. If you think about it, if you have a very strong cup of tea and the tea is sitting in the, in the pot for a very, very long time, when you have a sip, it's very dry and chalky and almost austere and mean on the palate. That's the tannin. And um, the French realised many, many years ago that using oak, it will soften the tannin, but the tannin needs to be toasted quite nicely. If you pick a grape, when you pick a tomato off a bush and you put it on the kitchen bench, it will ripen if you leave it there for three or four days. You can pick it under ripe. When you pick a grape, you cannot ripen. That's the absolute best it can possibly be. So you have to pick it when it's ripe. And if it's not ripe, you've got to add it to something else that has that ripeness to add that flexibility. There is a beauty to having slightly under ripe the green tannin is that hint of under ripeness. And if it was a negative, it would be bitter. 
I think you can have a hint of anti ripeness if you have it with something with a bit more ripeness, if it's all blended together and it comes together. So that's green tannin. So people consider it automatically to be a fault when actually it's not. It depends on the degree of the greenness. The skin tannin is really, if you have a Chardonnay grape, you don't need color from tannin. But if you were making a rose and you wanted to make a rose wine, you need the red wine, you're soaking the red grapes in the tannin. And if they're slightly green and underripe, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. Oak tannin itself is if you're using old oak that has, it's been used several times, we've called it seasoned oak, you're getting a small ingress of oxygen through, you still get that chalkiness on the palate. A way to sort of play with it is if you had a cup of tea, the English discovered, I don't know how many years ago, you could actually pour milk into the tea and it will make it softer. Yes, yes. So the oak makes that softer. Yes, the, the, the protein binds with the tannin. But we, we're running a bit behind time here. That's we okay. We're up along. to the Franck uh, Bonville, Pour Auger. It's the 2012 pure Grand Auger. Cru. Pure Auger means that it's a, a single crew wine. It's pure wine from grapes from the Auger village in the Côte de Blanc, which is the great part of Champagne for growing Ch uh, Chardonnay grapes. Franck Bonville is a family owned business and it's based in the Côte de Blanc and they have some great vineyards, all, mm -hmm. a lot of Grand Cru vineyards, three of which they made into single uh, Cru wines in the 2012 vintage, pure Auger, pure Menil and pure Avise. And we've got the Auger here. Now we both had this wine before and unfortunately, this wine is not quite as, it's not shining as well as it has in the past. We think the cork is having a little, little something to it's say. Just there. clips. Just. But it's not a lot. It's just, you know, we, um, we just have to make that proviso when we're describing it. Because the notes that are on the app are absolutely correct uh, for a good bottle of this wine. It's just a little scalped on the nose. Um, would you like to talk about the wine and how it tastes? Absolutely. As you can see, it's a lovely sort of straw hay color lovely sort of touch of golden that's probably from uh time resting on lees in the cellar and also because it is eight mm. years old this is mm. a 2012 so it's a vintage wine yeah. yeah for me i get those lovely sort of stone fruit citrus characteristics that you would expect with a chardonnay you definitely expect those sort of notes but again i almost get that white mushroom note that fresh young mushroom a little bit of um a hint of aldehyde, which is the age yes, of time on yes. but also I'm getting that bread dough, almost that croissant mm, sort mm. of note. And it is quite nutty, almost that almond sort of note. It is nutty, yeah. And I think yeah. it looked, because we looked at it about an hour ago, but I think it's a little bit fresher on the nose now. I think that what we want to enjoy is blown off a bit. And I think a wine like this, which has been, which has had some oak, and which is quite a rich wine, does, um, if you serve it at refrigerated temperature, it's perhaps a bit too cold, it's a bit too tight. Mm. So the wine has had a little time to come up and it's now showing more more amplitude and more detail than it did originally, which I is good. The creaminess on the pallets. Um, but if I looked at this wine in isolation, I'd be very happy with it if we hadn't looked mm. at it previously <laughs> a few weeks ago. Yeah. It's, it's almost yeah. an unfair comparison. This is not faulty. I would be very happy to drink this wine. Uh, it's only just... Thank you. Yeah. But one, one of the things I love about Franck Bonville is that they give you an enormous amount of information about the wines. And if you look at the back label of this wine, it's, uh, it's, uh, it says that um, 2,500 dozen, 2,500 bottles were produced, which is not a lot. Yeah. It was bottled in April 2013 and disgorged in September 2018. So five years on lease. So it's giving you all the, the dates. It tells you when the harvest happened, 15th of September, exact day that the grapes were picked. Um, and the dosage level, which is two grams per litre. That's the sweetening that's added after disgorgement. And oh, six years most life. wines have a lot. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> most wines have a lot more than that. Two grams per litre means it's ultra brute or extra brute. Absolutely. Extra brute, I think, is the designation. It's, it's extra brute and normally means it's the fruit has to be in absolutely pristine condition. It doesn't have the forgi forgiveness that sugar offers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is a, a, a very serious producer. I think all of the wines they make, all the wines I've seen anyway, have been Blanc de Blanc. So they're... Well, they've got all the Grand Cru vineyards in Cote de Blanc. Yes. Cote de Blanc is considered to be the epicenter of beautiful Chardonnay. Yes, 20, champagne. they only have 20 hectares, but when you've got 20 hectares of, of vines of that quality, it's mm. pretty special. Mm. So um, we rated it 96 out of 100. I don't think I've said that yet, have I? Which was number eight out of 52 Chardonnay-based 
champagnes from the 12 vintage, 2012, great vintage. We're suggesting drink it now and for the next five years, but I have no problem with, uh, with good cellaring, keeping it a bit longer. Um, and food match. We have a food match. From sure. I will say this is 100% Chardonnay, so it, I, do, I do think Chardonnays can linger in the cellar for so much longer, it's so much easier, because Chardonnay does age so slowly. Uh, their food match, and I love the 96 out of 100, that's pretty rock star, uh, is pan seed scallops with Beurblanc sauce. That's another thing. You can always change the, I think the Beurblanc sauce is a great idea to have. Uh, with this particular wine, you can change the protein, any sort of seafood, shellfish, white meat. Um, it's the garnish that's actually going to push you over the edge because this is eight years old. It's 2012. It is 100% Chardonnay. It's rich. It's opulent. It's offering you that ample sort of pleasure on the palate. You can play with it a lot more. You could have this with chicken. You could have it with pork. And the operative word is butter. Yes. Butter makes everything better. Butter and salt. And um, so would you like to put that Absolutely. Back? We're up to the uh, next wine. The next wine is? The Louis Roderer 2014 Brut Rosé. 2014. So it's quite a young wine. It's a new release, I believe. Um, it's the, my first 2014 out of Champagne. Is it? Yeah. I only just reviewed this today. So it's only just gone up into the system and the tasting note uh, should be visible by now, I hope, if you're... If you have the app in front of you, I haven't got the app. You should have the app, shouldn't you? Not in front of me, but I do have the app. Um, Louis Roderer, fantastic, unique house in Champagne. It is the biggest independent family owned and managed Champagne house and has an unusually large area of its of vineyards to supply its, uh, its needs. 242 hectares, of which more than half is Grand Cru. I've just had to read that several times before I could quite take it in. That's a lot of Grand Cru. I don't know anybody with that size that has that much Grand Cru as it's a unusual. proportion of their of their ownership. And a lot of the rest of it is actually Premier Cru too. So, and that supplies 70% of its annual requirement, which is a heck of a lot. They make about 3 million bottles a year, so they're not small. But it seems to me that just about, well, everything they do from the bottom of the apex to the top, which is Cristal, of course, the famous Cristal in its clear bottle, clear bottle. is magnificent wine. And, um, you know, the Russo family have owned it for a very long time. They've been a steady um, company ownership. And the winemaker for the last 20 years or so has been John, um, John Baptiste Le Caillon, who is a great guy, great winemaker. And I always like to say that Australians think that we own a little piece of Jean Baptiste because he worked out of here. He worked in Tasmania for several years before he started at Rotorua. In fact, he was a, an apprentice at Rotorua when he worked in uh, in Tasmania, and he made the first Jantz sparkling wines in Tasmania. But he's gone on to big, bigger and better things since then. What I'm loving. I'm loving this aroma right now. I think it's looking fantastic. This bottle was open maybe an hour, maybe a little bit more ago. And I think for me, you get these lovely sort of gentle aromas, floral, perfumed, almost that sandalwood, which is very much an Australian note for me, but I see it in Spanish wines and French wines. Um, a little bit of mandarin, a little bit of charcuterie. Pretty complex, isn't it? It is. It's just, it keeps throwing out a different sort of note. Lots of Pinot character. It's 63% Pinot Noir, 37% Chardonnay, and 17% fermented in barrels. Only 30% male likely fermentation, so it's got quite lively acidity. It is, but for me, you said 63% uh, Pinot Noir. Yeah. I get quite a lot of Chardonnay characteristic. It has gravitas, it has momentum, it has energy in the glass. You can see the Pinot in the fact that you have that lovely sort of forest floor, almost a oh. red apple sort of note, but on the palate, it's driven by that acidity. And it's a very, very young champagne, you know. It 2014 is, is a young champagne, and I think it looks better now than when we looked at an hour ago. But it's even it's younger than you might expect too. I think because that's the rotor style to me. The yeah. wines are very fresh and very slow aging, and a lot of people I know buy rotor not to drink but to put in the cellar for a year or two to, to give it a little extra time because they do respond to even a little bit of cellaring. I love the grip, that touch. We are talking about tannin before. That has just a hint of phenolic grip, and that's come probably from the skin. But because it's only just there and it's just visible, it adds intrigue. It makes it more complex. It makes it more appealing. It's actually part of the wine instead of separate from the wine. I think that adds glory to the glass. 
And I think that helps it go with food too. You, re yeah. you really need that backbone, that structure to go with food. Wines that are just sort of have no, no texture, which are like spring water, they don't go with food at all. No, food kills them. Yeah. So that wine will stand up to quite strong food, I suspect. And people, it's unforgiving, but often people only have rosé with sweet food and they really should have it with savoury. They can have it with uh, both. I think it's, it's, a, it's a real real mistake. <laughs> Unless it's quite a, a, a demi-sec or a slightly... Yeah. Slightly higher liqueur. I rose. think it's just an old rule that people still stick by. And if you look at uh, what the Maison suggests, they're saying chicken or veal, which I would agree with, morel mushrooms, that sounds fantastic, in a white or a cream sauce, potatoes, green beans, or a raw fish, carpaccio, kingfish, or ocean trout, both suitable. Serve with Whitloff, dress with uh, olive oil and chervil and sorrel. Uh, and then they've added a little note. I also had it recently with roast pork and potatoes, fresh pear compote, and Tuscan kale. Absolutely. I think this would, imagine having this with a roast chicken and veg. Like, is, sorry, the bottle should oh, be Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Just, I just missed it. Oh, sorry, no, I beg your pardon. It could go with so many things. And I'm sorry we, we didn't mention uh, that we rated it at 94 out of 100. So we're just backtracking there a little bit. Um, and I've said drink it for the next 10 years, 9 or 10 years, no problem with that. Uh, as I was saying before about keeping it longer, 94 out of 100 is a good score, but I've got no doubt that I would rate that higher in a few years' time because I think it's one of those wines that's just going to go like it that. It will go up. I think it looks good today. It'll look good in a few years' time. It'll look good a few years after that. So I, I love that sort of flexibility. So it's an example. If you get a six-pack, you play. Yeah, or become patient. If you're a, if you're a patient type yeah. of person. Okay, so that's um, Louis Roder. Um, we could we can sit here all night and talk about Louis Roder because they are an extraordinary firm. Uh, I've just noticed today that um, of that two forty two hectares of vineyards, one hundred and thirty five no one hundred and fifteen hectares of them have been certified organic as of October this year. So they've been building up, building up, building up, and they also do a lot of biodynamics, and they're one of the, the leaders of biodynamics in Champagne. And that's a discussion for another day, whether that... You it know, is. But as a grown market, they have a lot of their own vineyards, which means they have that control. When yep, you have growers, right, you can ask the critical. growers to do things, but they have some... As a grown market, it's unusual to have that, that many vineyards. It's a but, critical thing, isn't it, to but control... If, yeah, but if half of culture. the vineyards are now certified, it means they're probably rolling into the others waiting to be certified because it is a process. Yes. I think their aim is to get all um, certified. So we need to quickly go through a couple of questions and then the final two wines. So Ron says, love the tasting comments. Good question sometimes. Wines can have a dumb stage during the life cycle. Can champagne also display this? Ah. <laughs> How long is a piece of string? Some wines do and some don't, I think. What do you reckon? Well, I think because they're under cork, it's more likely than that if you have something that's under Stelvin or you can get sparkling wine, it's not champagne, under a crown seal. So you have that element of risk. And I think that sometimes, particularly when you have a vintage wine, uh, it's been sitting under cork for 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15, 16 years, however long it is. So they might need a bit of air. Um, I don't know so much about the dumb stage because, honestly, the chef de carve wouldn't release the wines. These wines are always released at least with three years of age, even non-vintages. By the time they've gone through a cycle and legally they have to be in the cellar for a certain amount of time, but nearly every single producer will exceed that non-vintage sort of limit. So if the wines aren't ready, they say, well, hang on, we wait. They are yeah. pretty precise like that. Yeah, it was it's what, three years for vintage and 15 months for non-vintages. It is, and then 15 months plus three months to rest in mm -hmm. the cellar. Mm -hmm. But then in order to get that extra complexity, that extra bit of age, and when you're having the non-vintage wines, people want to have a bit more oomph. Um, they do rest them for a bit longer. And if they if they don't need to pull them onto the market, they just let them rest. Because mm. when you're in Champagne, there are, they call them galleries when you go downstairs. And there's just kilometres and kilometres and kilometres of... Bottles, okay. it's fabulous. Right, we need to move on. Sorry, guys, but... Um, uh, I'll pull where you talk. Uh, okay, What's yeah. What's the next question? Right. So, John John Noble, you know the answer to this. John, you're, this is a Dorothy Dixer. What is the difference between Grand Cru and Premier Cru? Well, Grand Cru is given... They're the best sites and they are rated 100% of the A-shell, which is the price per kilo that's deemed... To be, a, to be the case for that vintage by the COVC, 
but the show there's a was lot of dealing going down. on behind it. Yeah, I'm the sure. show was broken down in 2003, but people still use the Grand Cru or the Premier Cru. Uh, there are uh, 42 vin uh, villages in Champagne that have um, are allowed to say they're Grand Cru or Premier Cru. Um, there's only a certain amount of villages that, in the past, um, if you were Grand Cru, literally somebody from the local council went out, drew a line around a plot and said, any fruit grown in this little box is Grand Cru. And that meant that they sold for, when they sold their fruit, they sold it at 100% of whatever the price was. And if you were in the neighbour and you were Premier Cru, maybe you're further down um, the hill or maybe you had too much around sunshine the side the around the side, the aspect wasn't quite favourable. You can That little box was considered Premier Cru. And then you got between 90 and 99% of whatever the dollar price was per kilo. That's obviously um, illegal at the moment. It changed in 2003, but you're still allowed to claim Grand Cru or Premier Cru. And the thing is, if you go to visit someone like Clos de Manil in Crook, they've got a big garden outside Clos de Manil. It's quite substantial in size. And I asked them, why didn't they plant vines there? And they said, oh, no, because inside the Clo, they actually drew a little box and the box. So they've now got like a, a, a stone bench the staff have lunch at and they just sit by the vines because there's loads of space. I mean, it's so funny, but that's how precise they are. And people mm -hmm. in France mm -hmm. will come along and check. But it's, it is considered to be proven and to have form mm. to have the highest quality. Good. Oh. Now we're moving on to the second last wine. We've got five uh, minutes Piper to get two oh, wines. Piper Heidsick 2012. So, yep. And Piper Heidsick, of course, is well known to anybody who buys a lot of champagne because you will have drunk, no doubt, drunk plenty of Piper non-vintage, which is in every supermarket and every bottle shop. Well, every, not so much in the independence, perhaps, but it's one of the most widely marketed and most visible brands in the entire business. It's the seventh biggest champagne house, Piper Heidsick, and they sell 4 million bottles a year. And um, yeah, it's everywhere and it's very, very good quality. And it's good value for money, it's, especially in this country. I think it's, um, we, uh, we, we sell it quite Yeah, We sell a lot and people recognize it and they Essentially, they're oceans and oceans of Piper Heidsick uh, non-vintage in the market. So people think that it's just ordinary, which I don't think is necessarily true, but it's assumed because it's available readily. They are in the same sort of family as Charles Heidsick. But they are now. They the joined two, up again. But the two the two styles are very, very different, aren't they? This um, is a much lighter, I think, and fresher style. Charles is a more mature style. How do you see them? Well, particularly with vintage, I think that's true. When you're looking at non-vintage, it's a little bit different. But mm -hmm. for me, this is quite an opulent style. It's, it has quite a bit of power on the palate. I think it's quite generous. There's a lot of those sort of stone fruit, again, the nectarine, the peach, a little bit of quince and compote. But for me, it's the acidity. It almost has this tightness to it. Totally agree with your comments about the non-vintage really sets the style of the house, doesn't yeah, it? it does. And the difference is very marked between Charles Heidsick Brut Reserve, which is gorgeously complex rich wine and the Piper non-vintage which, which is, is light and fruity. Cheeky. Cheeky. It's cheeky, cheeky and appealing wine. and it's, mm. it's a smashable champagne. There's that word. It, it is a smashable <laughs> I knew we'd have to have that word at some stage. Um, but this is the vintage Brut and it's from 2012 this one which is an excellent vintage. Cracking name. vintage. I think it's the, it's the length on the palate. It really does add that gravitas. It just keeps going and going and line and length for me is a real hallmark of quality wine. And when you're paying a bit more for a bottle of champagne, because these wines are not inexpensive, you want to make sure that you're getting that value for money. And you get that lovely sort of complexity, the savouriness, the time on lees. I think it almost has that sort of washed wine characteristic on the palate. Yes, um, it's typically half and half Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and sourced from 20 villages, which gives you a rough idea of how much you know, this is a small production compared to their non-vintage, tiny compared to their non-vintage, but still 20 villages involved. And there would be dozens and dozens of cuvées or, or batches of grapes from those um, villages. Um, it's mostly Grand and Premier Cru for this wine. So it's quite highly rated fruit goes into this. Um, a really nice wine. I it is love powerful. Wine. Yep. It is powerful. And um, I'm impressed. So let's move on to the final wine. Oh, the last wine. Which is um, Perige Wet. And this is, uh, oh, you're, you're doing the announcing, aren't you? Perige Wet, <laughs> Belle Epoque. Oh, um, yes. I'm gonna get, I mean, it's one of the most recognisable bottles 
that you'll find. I think when I was a student, everybody I knew had one of these bottles with a candle in it, just because it's considered to be so pretty, but it, it's an extraordinary one. It's a bit one. higher class than the candy store, straw wrapped candy bottle. But it is a beautiful bottle. And I think originally those were probably hand painted under the bottle, but there's a big story about how it was created. We won't tell you about that tonight because we want to talk about the wine, but you can read about it uh, in, you can read about it on the Real Review because I've, I've written a story about it in the past. But this is um, one of the, what we call prestige cuvee or deluxe cuvee. And they are the creme de la creme of any champagne house. They save their very best fruit for this sort of wine. And then they age it for typically longer than most wine is aged for. This, um, this wine is, um, a Perrier Jouet is, uh, it's in the same stable as um, uh, the Mums, isn't it? Mum. Which is part of the Pernod Ricard group. And the Pernod Ricard group um, is quite a big, I think it's the, uh, the house is the 10th biggest house in Champagne. And uh, Pernod Ricard is the fifth largest group in Champagne. So they know just, a lot about Champagne. Just saying something. <laughs> Um, it's more than 200 years old, this house, but it hasn't been owned for very long by Pernod Ricard, but they've got some very good winemakers and some very good vineyards. And I think after a period of slightly turbulent past, it's now in a period of, it's in a good place and it's a stable period of its life. They have something like 65 hectares of vineyards, which provide a quarter of their requirements. So there again, there, there's the story of Champagne they rely on enormous number of growers to provide most of their fruit. Um, this wine, let me tell you about this wine. It's a deluxe cuvee, which has Pinot Meunier in it, which is not a common thing. Most deluxe cuvees just have Pinot Noir and Chardonnay or one or the other. I can think of Krug and Perrier Jouet that use Pinot Meunier in their yep. prestige, hmm. which is unusual. And I love the fact that this is 50% Chardonnay in 2012, and the wine that we just had before was 50% Chardonnay in 2012. So same vintage, mm -hmm. same proportion of Chardonnay. This feels slightly more moderate. It just has that line and length on the palate just continues, continues to deliver. It lingers. So I think that when you look at wines, you don't need to have a loud wine to have a pleasurable wine. There's an enormous Very amount of pleasure in this glass, mm. but it feels a little bit quieter and subdued after the piper. Which seen, it, I don't think the piper was broad, but it was just more of a cheerleader almost. The piper the pipe was letting it all hang out. This wine is holding something in reserve. It, cheerleader. It is reserved. It's yeah. quiet. It's when you have that somebody's whispering a, a, a delicious secret in your ear. You're just like, this is fantastic. But it, it's such a wonderful sort of experiment to have 50% from the same vintage of Chardonnay. And then you see what this can deliver. It's the different way it's been handled. It's the different area that um, the fruit mm. has been picked. Mm. This is a particularly elegant wine. I agree with that totally. It's five to six years on Lees, so That's it's not particularly fair. long for a deluxe cuvee, but it's pretty long. Um, the Chagri, the Chardonnay is really dominating this wine. And if you talk to the winemaker, the chef de cave, Hervé uh, Deschamps, Hervé yep. Deschamps, Hervé, Hervé, I think it's Herve. Deschamps. Um, Deschamps. Herbert. Herve. Herve. <laughs> he will say that Chardonnay is what he likes to think of as the signature of his blends. And he likes to emphasize the Chardonnay and this is, and he talks about the Pinot Meunier as being a bridge between the Pinot Noir and the Pinot Chardonnay, and the Chardonnay, which I think is a lovely expression. It marries the two or helps marry the two of them together. This is a beautiful wine, but it's a wine, I suspect, carrying on from what you were saying, if you show that to most people, they'll say, well, what's all the fuss about? Why is that so expensive? It's a quiet, it's a quiet wine. It whispers, it doesn't shout. It's a $250 wine or more. Um, but that is a wine which will grow on you. And I guarantee that the more you drank of that wine, if you're lucky enough to be in the company of someone who was wealthy enough to afford it, you would enjoy it more and more the more you had of it because it grows on you. And all great wines grow on you, I think. I literally want to go back for another sip now. I think uh, this wine is singing. And the fact is, as we know, Chardonnay ages at a much slower pace than any other grape. And when the winemaker decided to make this wine and the piper before, when they decide on having 50% Chardonnay, they know that it's going to become more beautiful and have longevity yes. later on. So yes. you can drink it now and get an enormous amount of pleasure. But I think I would love to see this wine in 8, 10, 12 years. Yeah, I me think too. It, I think me it too. will definitely still be alive and kicking. Gee, I wonder if anybody will be able to 
open a bottle for me and tender to a bit. So quickly before we finish, it got 97 points. This scored 97 points, which is a very high gold ribbon score. And we said, drink it now and for another five years. But as Amanda was just saying, it will go on a lot longer than that if you look after it. And finally, the food match. The uh, Maison has come back with perfect with a delicate white fish like sole. But when I taste this, I think of Gravelax with a little bit of purple mm -hmm. onion and some sour cream on some ghetto white bread. Imagine mm -hmm. Christmas Eve with that or Christmas Day when you're just having a, a lovely sort of afternoon. You've got a royal family piece of the Champagne House. You've got a simple meal that you can prepare two days earlier. So you can all sit down, enjoy and have a moment. You don't have to have the fanciest food to enjoy that moment with a bottle of wine. You can just have the, mo the moment with the wine. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, honestly, if I'm having a really bad week and it's my husband's birthday and we need to celebrate, I'll get sushi and have a bottle of champagne. It's so easy. You pick it up, go to the shop, da -da -da -da, you got a bottle of champagne in the fridge and everyone can relax and just take a breath. And I don't know about you, but when I have my first sip of champagne, it doesn't matter where I am or what's happening, everything suddenly seems to be okay with the world. And <laughs> so it's a good remedy for the birthday party when you've forgotten to buy anything else. It absolutely is. And it just slows everything down. I mean, it, it's December, which I love and I hate at the same time because it has that crazy festive sort of feeling. It's the end of the year and, you know, Hewan and I were talking earlier and I think that everybody knows somebody who loves champagne and if you're not sure because when people love champagne you don't know exactly what they want it's such a safe and exciting alternative is to give them a bottle of champagne I always go for champagne or fortified it is that time of year the reason we're doing the champagne now is because it's December people are celebrating the end of 2020 in such a big way okay. why not do it with any number um, of champagne. Have something that you've never had before. And if it turns out they don't like it, they, it's eminently it's more for you. More re for giftable, me. isn't it? Yeah. Very re giftable. We're not going to enjoy that. Okay. We can open it later. We, we are, we're over time. We've got to close off. Um, Excellent. Thanks for joining us today. We've had fun. I hope you have too. And I hope you've had something decent to drink. Please subscribe to The Real Review if you don't already. And uh, if you want the wines, as I said before, you can go to Cellar Door Direct on our website and order direct from the winery. The next thing we're going to do is in January, 14th of January, that's for Riesling, Eden and Clare Valley Rieslings, another Zoom cast. And on Saturday, the 23rd of January, uh, we'll be down in Tasmania and we're going to be doing a live broadcast outside somewhere, hopefully in a vineyard or near a winery. Under a tree in the shade. Somewhere in Hobart, yeah. near Hobart, Tasmania. So please join us for, for that. Sorry we didn't get to answer all your questions, but um, I hope we got to answer a few of them. Yeah. So cheers. Merry Christmas and good health. Can't wait and for 2021. And here's to 2021 if it's not a bit premature. Yeah. Are we allowed cheers. to clink? Yes. We're going to clink. Cheers. Cheers.